As a parent, no two days are ever the same. At Care.com, you can find trusted and flexible sitters to help manage your family's ever-changing schedule. Care.com can even help you out with housekeepers, dog walkers, senior caregivers, and more. So you can find care for all you love. And 100% of caregivers who use Care.com have been background checked with CareCheck, a key first step in hiring confidently. To get the help you need to make it all work, sign up now and find a great sitter at Care.com. Welcome to the Behind the Bits podcast. Your host, Scott Curtis, wants to learn everything he can about stand-up comedy and take you along for the ride. Scott and his guests talk serious about comedy in every episode. Behind the Bits will uncover knowledge from different perspectives on subjects such as writing and performing stand-up comedy, as well as booking shows and the comedy life. If you're thinking about becoming a stand-up comic, already in the comic game, or a comedy nerd, Behind the Bits is the show for you. Now, let's get Behind the Bits. Hey, BTP buddies, this is a repeat of the Lace Larrabee episode done in late 2021. I'm putting it out there because she's on America's Got Talent tonight, 8-9-2022. And to be totally transparent, I'm just taking advantage of the algorithm. But this is a great episode. If you missed it, it's a great one to listen to. If you didn't miss it, it's a great one to listen to again. So here's Lace Larrabee. My guest tonight is an Atlanta-based, nationally touring comedian and actor who can be seen all over the country. She was named Best Local Comedian in 2018 by the readers of Creative Loafing Magazine. I need to subscribe to that. You have seen her on Viceland's Flophouse as well as the Fox show's Laughs, Dish Nation, and Punchline. And there's a lot more, too. If that's not enough, in order to give back to aspiring female comics, she started an all-female comedy class called Laugh Lab at the legendary Punchline Comedy Club. Folks, it's Lace Larrabee. Lace. Hi, Scott. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for being on the show. Of course. Hey, first of all, I would like to say I just met Gwen Sunkel at... Yeah, at uh, the comedy festival in Bloomington, Indiana, uh-huh. um, and we just had an absolute blast together. She was one of I don't want to like pick favorites, but if I <laughs> if there were a contest as to who was my favorite comedian that I met and hung out with the whole weekend, I gotta say it was Gwen's uncle. Yeah, yeah, it she's... was. Absolutely incredible. Oh, and that was Limestone, by the way. For those of you right. who don't know what festival it is in Bloomington, it is um, it is Limestone, and she is based in Indianapolis, like you said. And I had never met her, and I saw her do a set one night, and I fell in love immediately. And uh-huh. then we clicked, and we hung out the whole weekend. And on the way out the last day, I was like at one of the coffee shops that like sponsored the festival, uh-huh. and who walks in? when I'm in my like ready to hit the road and hit, go get an airport look is Gwen. And I, we, I was like, this was meant to be. She yeah. was my last goodbye in Bloomington. <laughs> she was like my first love there. And then my last goodbye. And I was like, we, yeah. she might be my next spouse. Like I think, yeah. <laughs> I think when I, you know, probably inevitably when my husband is done with my shit, then, uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to call up Gwen Sunkel. She's so cool. I freaking love her. I'm so I glad you shouted her out. I'm yeah. just. I'm yeah. Jazzed. And I can't wait for the album to come out. I mean, we're I not going to see it until next year, but I'm, I know, I'm, I know. I'm really stoked for it. So I do a diversity check on my podcast sometimes to make sure I'm talking to enough women, people of color. Between you and her, I've done three women in a row. So I think I'm up to 15% women when yours comes out. So okay. I think that's okay. Scott, of that's, color, that's I think not I'm enough. 20%. It's not yeah, enough, but... <laughs> 
You're doing good. Hey, the <laughs> fact that you're checking is more yes. than most people are doing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we could do better. We could do better. Yeah, I, I, I teach an all women's comedy class, and I can assure you that there are way more women doing comedy. Than all right. Well, think. send them my way. I, I, will. I don't I, I never say no, but some women say no to me. Uh, <laughs> Paula Poundstone. I'll just shout that out. Damn it, Paula. What's wrong with you? We got to uh, get yeah. Paula on. Paula's one of my favorites. <laughs> I listen to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me every single weekend. Yeah. And she is on, I don't know, what, 30 percent of the time. She's one of the panelists. Yeah. And yeah. Come on, Paula. Oh, man. I did get to see her up in uh, Coldwater, Michigan a couple years oh, yeah? ago. And it was a great show. I didn't know she did so much crowd work, but she, it was fantastic. She's incre she is incredible on the spot. That's one of the best things that she does. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to say I've never seen her live, but, like, I've watched so many clips of hers. And like I said, I'm a massive fan of Wait, Wait. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just – she's so good with the guests and with, with the hosts and everything. She's – quippier than anyone else that's her yeah. whole jam i did want to mention the first I, you know i've only seen you once and i saw you here in huntsville my wife and i yes. moved down to huntsville and the first uh, comedy show that we saw was the one that uh, scott eason puts on there at low mills and we yes. saw you and laughed we, we we laughed and laughed and laughed i hope you don't take this the wrong way but I kind of called you a Leanne Morgan for people who don't mind hearing fuck. If I <laughs> could pay you for that quip, I'm going to write okay. that down into my new bio. Yeah, Leanne there you Morgan go. Morgan for people who don't mind hearing fuck. Yeah. Um, I love that. She yeah. She, another idol of mine. I mm -hmm. worked with her. I did some TV with her back in the day. And uh, Leanne Morgan is it. She's the fact that so many people are just now finding out who she is blows mm -hmm. my mind because I've known yeah. who she is for years. She is so funny. And the fact she is, what's his name? Who I love. He's one of the, Brian Regan. She oh, yeah. is like the female Brian Regan. Yeah. Yeah. How is she so clean and so funny and right. so Southern? Yeah. Like, I am the funny and the Southern, I hope. I mean, I'm uh -huh. the Southern. There's no getting around that. But, like, I hope I'm that funny. But, damn it, that's a great fucking reference. That all is. All right, all right. Oh, oh, man. <laughs> I'm glad I'm, you took it the right way. <laughs> I'm writing that down. No, that's good. That's good. I'll take it. I did a little bit of looking, and, unfortunately, somebody did a really great print interview with you. So, I know everything about you now. So, everything I ask, I already know. Let's talk about how you got into comedy and yeah. why you got into comedy. I mean, I love comedy. Always been a fan of comedy. My family's very funny. My family, my parents had me when I was a teenager, or when, they, when I was a teenager. That's weird. <laughs> they had me when I was a teenager, so let's get in the DeLorean and figure out how that happened. Yeah. Um, no, they were teenagers when they had me. Man, we were young and poor as a family, and we all were raised together, so... And thankfully, both of them had a really great sense of humor, and that's how we got through all hard things, right? Mm -hmm. We and my parents are still together, and uh, I mean, if it weren't for the sense of humor, I don't think all that would be true. I wouldn't be doing mm -hmm. comedy. I wouldn't have two amazing supporting parent, supportive parents. But uh, yeah, always been a fan of comedy because my parents were young. They let me watch stuff when I was younger. I was also the I'm obviously the firstborn. I always felt like I was being raised with the adults because they were becoming adults when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So it's like they let me in on adult things and they thought it was okay for me to watch and yeah. they thought I could take it. And I did. And I, I loved it. Big fan. I always, I didn't know how to get into comedy, but long story short, after years of performing as an actor and a pageant girl and all that stuff, the things I had access to, you know, in mm -hmm. South Georgia, I, um, was bartending for years, pursuing acting again in my adulthood yeah. Nothing was really taken off, just a bunch of auditions that went nowhere. And I had a regular at my bar who started running shows. He knew that I loved comedy and knew that I was too busy to get into it. And he booked me on a show he was running and mm -hmm. said, you've got two months or three months, whatever it was at the time to prepare. You've got to do 10 minutes on a show. Oh, wow. Yeah. And as any comic knows, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> 10 minutes might sound like nothing to people who are like, oh, I can do comedy. I got hours oh, yeah. of material. I've never been on stage, but I got hours. Right. <laughs> 
I see that a lot. Yeah. Which is most <laughs> people who come up to you and are like, I'm ready to do comedy. I got yeah. hours. And you're like, oh, cool. How many shows? And they're like, none. I'm like, <laughs> so you got a tight 30 seconds is what yep. I'm hearing. A tight 30 seconds. Um, yeah. So thankfully I loved comedy and I was obsessed over it and I had studied it enough and had been on stage enough that like the stage part didn't scare me and the mm. holding the mic and the mm -hmm. addressing the audience, which is half the battle, you know, that didn't mm. scare me. So I kind of studied it and I just, I wrote jokes about my life. I got on stage. I did a, I gotta say, I did a decent eight and a half. And yeah, that's uh, great. yeah, that first video of the first time I got on stage got me into the first two comedy festivals I ever got into. Wow. Yeah. Nobody so likes you, to you're, hear that. You're kind of a natural. You're, you were born for this. I, I honestly, listen, I used to be ashamed of that. I used to try to hide it. I used to, I think even in a few early interviews, I tried to like pad it a little bit more. Uh -huh. And honestly, at this point, like in my late thirties, I'm like, screw it. That's, I worked my ass off my yeah. whole life. You know, yeah. like I earned that moment. The first time I did stand up was the thing that changed my life yeah. for the yeah. better, you know? Right saved me from a really bad relationship I had just gotten out of and a horrible mm -hmm. job I was in. And I quit mm -hmm. the job. I got rid of the ex and uh stand up was like the freeing moment of my life. So mm -hmm. I'm really proud of it. Now I used to like yeah. try to cover it up and honestly, hell, of course I was good. Of course yeah. I was good. The first time I had a lot of shit to bitch about. So right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and your, yeah. your style is very, conversational and story driven and yes. you're very good at making your time on stage feel like it's the first time you said it Man, and th and i know that's, that's a what huge really draws, compliment yeah that's what, that's what really draws an audience in because they all you know audiences always want to be the first to hear something and you know i i just saw that in you i it just felt like first time you said it and Thanks. I know that's not the case because I know how many times you have to say it before you get it right. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the behind the bits, uh, yeah. so you know, that's, <laughs> you know, that's not how it works. Now, granted, I would say, I don't know which shows you came to on the weekend of the Epic Comedy Hour uh, 10 year anniversary, because there were a couple shows uh, that maybe some things I said were the first time I said yeah. them. We did the... <laughs> We did the, the, what was it? Drunk Sober High show. Okay. And I, ch I chose to be the high one. Uh -huh. I, was, I was originally um, supposed to be the sober one on the show. Okay. And I, uh, I worked behind the scenes uh, with someone who was picked to be one of the high ones. And I was like, could I just, when I saw that the high thing was an option of um, edible fruity pebbles. There you go. I don't know how clean yeah. we need to be, but you, no, know, you don't edible you don't fruity pebbles. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so fruity pebbles full of weed. I was like, <laughs> can I do that? I was like, I heard don't smoke a lot or do a lot. I was like, can I, I would, but I'm out of town. I, am, I have no thing. I have nothing to do tomorrow. Can I eat the fruity pebbles instead? And uh, uh -huh. this other comic, let me do that. So that night on stage, um, I did do stuff I've never said on stage uh -huh. ever before. So I don't think that you're referring to that night. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that was totally different. Yeah, it was totally it different. was a showcase. Uh, Dwight Simmons was on it, and yeah, Alex yeah. was on it. So I, I, I think it was Saturday okay. night. Was it Saturday? Okay. I think yeah. Friday maybe was the one where it was like the first one, the good one where we weren't all sloshed and yeah. or high. I mean, it was yeah. We were all trying to be professionals. I think uh -huh. that's the one you saw. What does it feel like to be up there? I mean, do you remember what you said? Uh, when you were high I mean how much did it kick <laughs> in before you got yes. up there yes that's what's funny okay so that's the difference like I'm not a huge drug person or anything mm -hmm. uh I spent so much of my life being like a pageant kid and yeah. before that I was a cheerleader and I've always I was like president of the uh the FBLA and uh -huh. student council and I was a gifted student so I was like the super nerdy like clean like you know party pooper for a yeah. long time and I was just driven and just focused on the future so I'm not really like that person I haven't like really experimented with a lot of stuff mm. and uh, weed is the only thing and it's only literally yeah. past 30 was when I started like yeah. trying weed and I uh -huh. only really like edibles like I can't smoke. I cough too hard. Yeah. Um, so like I'm super nerdy about it, but 
my favorite thing for any listeners who like to drink, the difference between getting a little too drunk and getting a little too high, you remember everything when you're high. Yeah. That's what's <laughs> weird. When you can get drunk, black out, you can like move to another country, yeah. commit some crimes. <laughs> like, <laughs> you did not know what the hell you participated in. When you're high, though, it's weird. It's like this weird, like, state of just, like, you're suspended. Yeah. And you're you're there, and you remember it, but it's so silly. And that, I honestly wish I would have known more about weed back in the day instead yeah. of alcohol. Mm -hmm. Because I think that would have been my first vice, really. Yeah. Because yeah. it's, uh, and now it's just an occasional thing. But it's, man, it's so much more fun. So, yeah, when I was picked for the... When I got to, when I weaseled my way into being the high person on the show, um, <laughs> I enjoyed the hell out of it. I remembered everything I said, but I remember laughing harder on stage at the dumbest jokes I've ever written. Oh, yeah. I the laughed giggles. harder. Yeah, it's the, the giggles, giggles yeah. dude. Yeah. I got giggle fits <laughs> like I've never gotten in my life on stage. Uh. <laughs> and I remember that moment, like, like it, it was better than any moment of like killing with material that is tried and true that I've worked on that I've tagged the hell out of that uh -huh. is delivered in the perfect way to the perfect audience. <laughs> Just giggling my ass off at some half written jokes yeah. in my notes in my phone. <laughs> Honestly, I remember every bit of it and it was so fun and so much funnier. So that's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, all great. I can say is I've been there. So I, yeah. I, I, I and and I've been a little bit too much too. And, right? And, yeah. yeah. Oh, it was too much. Yeah. There's no way I could have headlined a show with that amount yeah. of fruity pebbles in my uh. system. Let's be clear. Like I couldn't headline. And let me tell the other thing about it is I think we were also do like seven minutes, and I think I was like two minutes in, and I was like, man, I've been up here for way too long. <laughs> I have ran the light and they're uh, like, bitch, you're two minutes in. Oh no. <laughs> I've got to do five more minutes. Oh, this is it's terrifying. all the classic stuff. You're suspended in animation. <laughs> yes. Time yes. time slows down. Time slows it's it's down. it's great. <laughs> but, so I say all that to say, uh freaking Scott Eason puts on an incredible <laughs> ten year yeah. reunion of the yeah. show. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Uh, oh, man, it was the best. He's he's it was a great best. guy, and it's funny when I when I came to Huntsville, I went to an open mic that he runs, and yes. I first of all, I'm not a real chatty guy unless we're talking about something like this, like something that's yeah. important to both of us. I don't like talk about the weather, or sports, or anything like that. So I went up and I yeah. said, "Hi, Scott. My name's Scott. I'm from South Bend, and I'll be on the list tonight." And then I walked away and talked to another uh, comedian, and then I went up. And he was, I think he was expecting me to be like a first timer. I decided, okay, I'm not going to work out anything new. I'm going to bring the greatest hits and give you five minutes to show you who Scott Curtis is. And, Smart. and when he was Smart. done, he was like, he was like, oh, so you're a real comic then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, when you come up and you have just such a brief intro like that, no, everyone expects like, oh, this guy's nervous. Like that's yeah. why he probably yeah. thought like, oh, well. You're just saying that to get it out of the way because you got to get your nerves out of the way. Yeah, so yeah. smart, <laughs> smart move. Very, real slick. Real yeah, slick thank of you. Me. Your act, like I said, is very polished and it's seamless. So let's think about your act now versus when you started. I, I know that mm. that first 10 minutes got you into a lot of stuff and got you really the ball rolling for you. But mm -hmm. what? how has things changed from when you started to now? Oh man. So the biggest thing that changed was my delivery. I think two things. Let's, let's be honest. So delivery for sure is what changed everything because delivery didn't just change me on stage. It also changed how I was writing. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are connected, right? So when you very first start, so many people are, are filled with the fear of like, what if the audience doesn't like me? Right? So mm -hmm. we, tend to accidentally write for the audience instead of writing for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So many of us make that mistake. And I think that goes hand in hand with, well, if I'm writing for the audience, I need to deliver like a comedian. And we tell ourselves that, right? So if you're mm -hmm. doing one thing wrong, you're going to do the other thing wrong. So I think over time and being exposed to so many more audiences uh, in so many different areas and doing different amounts of time on stage. When you go from doing, you know, a type five 
to a seven, to a 10, to a 15, to a 25, to a 30, you have to gradually get more comfortable with your voice Mm -hmm. and more comfortable. And that goes hand in hand with your writing. So you've got to get more comfortable with your writing. So the biggest difference is when I first started, gotta be honest, that first set wasn't bad because I just, I wrote from what I knew. I made fun of my Mm -hmm. name, my family, Mm -hmm. uh, the relationship I had just gotten out of Mm -hmm. uh, and the job I had at the time. Those Mm -hmm. weren't hard subjects. I had the material. I knew the rhythm of stand up, so I wrote those, um, and it worked. Mm-hmm. What happened though is I got in a rhythm of, well, this thing worked, so I can't switch it up. If I write mm-hmm. a new thing, it's got to fall exactly in line with the other thing I wrote, and it can't change up from there. And then mm-hmm. I was terrified of being on stage without having a full plan every single time from first word to last word. Uh-huh. And so I got a little robotic and I think a lot of comics in their first two years get very robotic because they're scared. If I mess up the audience, if this works, then the audience might not like me if I don't do exactly what I know what works. Right. right. Mm-hmm. And then a moment happens. So the man I'm married to now, uh, he was doing comedy at the time. He had been doing it for like, 13 years I think when we met or something like that he's done comedy for like 20 years and Mm -hmm. he's taking a hiatus off right now so he's not really doing it right now he did for a long time lived in LA for a while was on Comedy Central and a million other things and uh, I lucked up and he took me on the road with him very early on when we Mm -hmm. met and we started dating and he's like you're really funny and it wasn't just because I was hot I mean I know those are part of it (laughs) but that wasn't all But he genuinely was like, he had taken other women on the road before and guys. He had taken both guys and girls on the road and everything else. And he met me and he was like, well, she's funny, but she's also single. I'm single. Let's let me take her on the road. And then he didn't mind giving me harsh truths early on. Uh And one of the biggest things he did for me very early on in comedy was I was, we were in Cincinnati one night. We were working Go Bananas. I had been in comedy for like a year and a half. And in the green room, after my feature set, he said, you sound like you're trying to sound like a comedian. And then he like walked off to do his hour. And I Uh sat in that green room and just, I cried. Yeah. (laughs) That was hard to hear. Yeah. Because I had been doing comedy for, like I said, a year and a half. Uh Thought I had built up from a five, you know, granted an eight back to a five, to a 10, to this. I'd worked my way up. I had already featured at multiple places. And mm-hmm. then to be told that I still, in my mind, I'm a feature at clubs. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what do you mean? I still sound like I'm trying to be a comedian. And I took it really hard. That is what shook me up for me to go, okay, why do I sound like I'm trying to be a comedian? And then I switched it to, let me just talk like I talk in person. And just go with what happens, like in a conversation. As long Mm -hmm. as you have a game plan as to what you will end on when you need to end, plan ahead, you can have a good time in between and still Mm -hmm. be funny. If you have enough tried and true material, you can fucking relax. You don't have to stress out every single time. And that was my biggest problem. That was a very long answer to a very simple question, but stopping writing for the audience, write for yourself, write what Mm -hmm. makes you laugh, and then deliver it in the way that still makes you laugh. Deliver it like you would if you were at a party and talking to a group of friends. Yeah, that's a really important thing. I, I started later. I didn't start until I was 52. And I didn't really realize that fact of do what's funny and don't try to sound like a comedian until just like a year ago. And, and it hurts, right? When you oh, realize yeah. it, like it, it well, makes you think like- It hurts well, you when, you watch you were... your, yeah, when you watch your film. <laughs> And that's what it took too. When he said that, I was pissed. I was like, what? What are you talking about? I was like, I do, I'm great on stage. I get laughs every time. Uh And what I didn't realize, I wasn't getting laughs as many times as I could get laughs. And I wasn't getting as genuine of laughs. I was getting like laughs because, okay, that was written funny. I wasn't getting laughs because I was making people laugh. Does that make sense? I think what you're saying is you weren't making yourself a sympathetic character. You were pretty much reading the jokes. I was making jokes. Yeah. Yeah. 
I was writing jokes. They were about me, but I wasn't as in on it as the audience needed me to be. And then I started speaking from a more real perspective and being like, no, 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 y'all. I know I'm saying this and I know Mm -hmm. I look like X, Y, Z, but let me tell you, blah, blah, blah. Right. Right. And then I started learning how to tag jokes to make them more understandable to an audience based on their perceptions of me. And and that's another big thing. You got to start to realize people's perceptions of you. If you don't mm-hmm. understand how strangers take you, you're never going to be a good comedian. You yeah. have to know how everybody else sees you. Cause if not, you sound ridiculous. So yeah. that's another switch too. And that's just, that's just experience as mm-hmm. well. I think, yeah. you know, and it's it's hard to live up to that because you know in, in my case I'm six five I'm a giant and people are scared of me when they see me because I, I look at like an intense guy and and yeah. that's so far from the truth then my delivery is a lot like David Letterman so people say your delivery is like David Letterman. I said well you know I I watched him a lot but this is really me so yeah. I, and I can't move away from it I say golly I do you know I do all the stupid stuff that midwesterners do and yeah. old and everything else so that you know yeah. it's just what it is I understand that and I tried because I'm pretty clean I could open for Leanne Morgan easily um but, uh, <laughs> which was but, which let's be honest if this gets to her I can also work clean and I work clean all the time when I'm paying all right for it. So yeah. let's not say I don't. I just right, knew excellent. they didn't have to be in Huntsville. <laughs> but uh, Leanne, I'm happy to work with you. Yeah. I can be very clean. <laughs> She'd be lucky very. to have you. Yeah. Oh, I would love to work with her. Oh, she has yeah. the best crowds. She, my, she's my mom's favorite comedian. So yeah, let's I put bet. it that way. Yeah. 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 She, yeah. I mean, she's just absolutely hilarious. And I, I'll best. see the same bit three times and laugh three times still laugh every single time oh she's a genius her delivery is amazing Uh yeah yeah (laughs) now i want to make sure that because you're doing such a great thing i want to make sure that we talk about laugh lab uh, I know I'm oh, jumping yeah, around a little please. bit, but it's such a great thing that you're doing because I've been in classes before. A lot of times it's five white guys and <laughs> one woman. It is what it is. And whether it's on purpose or not, the woman's comedy sometimes gets stifled unless uh, unless mm-hmm. she's super confident and ready to go. So let's talk about why you started Laugh Lab and what you do with it. Sure. Thank you so much. I, uh, so it's funny. It's four years ago. Uh, this almost week, uh, I think a week ago today was the four year anniversary of the first time I announced online that I was going to teach the class. It graduated the first week of December, four years ago. Um, I started it because I was helping three different women in Atlanta who all started comedy, like over 40. Mm -hmm. And they had all decided then they had gone out and tried the open mic scene and they were like, this is ridiculous. They, yeah. they were not getting anywhere in it. They hated it. They hated the process of going through like the waiting until midnight or later on a Wednesday to get stage time for four minutes at a time. And they're like, there's got to be more to this. All of them had different goals. One mm-hmm. of them had a goal of like doing one woman show. One had a goal of being a motivational speaker instead. One had a goal of specifically working um, in the realm that she, she was Jewish and she's a mother and she's all these things. And she's like, I want to specifically work for the people who were looking for exactly me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, private gigs. That's a whole world girl. Yeah. yeah. It's good. <laughs> good goal. Like let's do it. And so they all wanted to perfect their material. One recommended me to the other one recommended me to the other. Once that got around, I was working with all of them privately and they were, people were started hitting me up. And I was Mm -hmm. like, okay, I cannot continue to do this. I'm pursuing my own career. What if I just taught a class? So I hit up the punchline, the Atlanta punchline, Mm -hmm. who's one of my home clubs, the laughing skull and the punchline. I would always say both of my home clubs Mm -hmm. love them equally. And, uh, the punchline's like family to me. And I was like, if I want to teach a class, what are the, what's the deal? Could I do it here? We worked out a great deal. And then I advertised a class. I was like, let me get this out of the way. Let me help whoever wants to do this. So I put it out there. I said, all women's class. And I said all women specifically because every woman I had talked to discussed all of their hurdles being out there in the open mic world. Mm -hmm. So many of them had to do with getting railroaded by guys at shows. They would interrupt them. They would ignore them. They tried to introduce themselves. And 
it just wouldn't get them anywhere. Worst case scenario, they were sexually assaulted one mm-hmm. way or the other, you know, whether verbally or immediately after some dude would send them a dick pic or whatever. And it just yeah. happened over and over and over. And, or guys would ask them to open for them, but they were really just trying to hook up. And I just, Hey, we've got a new sponsor here on behind the bits. It's called Drizzly D R I Z L Y. We're always celebrating something in summer, weddings, birthdays, showers, graduations, Wednesdays, the list goes on. And finding the perfect gift for those celebrations can be tough, or at least it was because now there's Drizzly, the number one app for alcohol delivery. With Drizzly, you can compare prices on the largest selection of beer, wine, and spirits, then send them to that special someone in under 60 minutes, or schedule it up to two weeks in advance. It's basically the ultimate gifting cheat code because drinks are the ultimate gift. Think about it. When's the last time you returned alcohol? Never? Exactly. I went to the Drizzly site and looked up bourbon and there are 126 pages of bourbon. Oh, and by the way, 416 pages of IPA beers. The best part is when you enter your gift tees address, Drizzly will check inventory in all their participating liquor stores around them so you don't have to worry about buying something that's out of stock. So if you're looking to spend more time celebrating and less time gift shopping, download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com to find their favorite drinks without breaking the bank today. I've heard the story so many times from so many people that I can't even count it. It's everybody. It's almost every woman I know who started comedy who had either a negative, like, you don't matter, you're not funny, women aren't funny, you're just Mm. Amy Schumer reaction. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Or because like they can't just see that every woman has a different story to tell and they just go, oh, you said the word vagina. You're just Amy Schumer. There's no yeah. way you could have a different take on your most important body part. How could that possibly be the case? Yeah. And then, you know, and if you talked about being married, they're like, oh, you're just every other female comic. And I'm like, every dude I know has a joke about dating or being married or they're penis Mm -hmm. or whatever so many women were railroaded and ignored and then or hit on and then they all quit Mm -hmm. so i was like let me teach a class i opened up a class it sold out immediately i was like what am i doing what did i sign up for i taught them they were great then i had a wait list and then the next (laughs) class i taught a whole class and before i finished that one there was a wait list and there were six week long classes and there was a wait list there was I am right now teaching my 27th class in wow. four years. And during the pandemic, I had to switch it up. And now I do a co-ed class as well. So they're not all, all women anymore. I've done three co-ed classes now, mm-hmm. uh, but I still offset those from, I still do the all women class. Like mm-hmm. that's what so many women sign up for because so many of them either had a horrible experience in the open mic world mm-hmm. or they took a class that was exactly like you described. There was yeah. one woman in the class or two and it was taught mm. by a dude and no offense to the dudes but they were just like oh could you not talk about your period and they're like well i don't know that's a third of my life so yeah. how do i not <laughs> so you don't so is everyone not allowed to talk about food like yeah. what are you not allowed to talk about you know yeah. like oh, that's my experience and you just don't think it's funny because you don't experience it but you forget that 50 percent of the audience and the major ticket buyers are all women yeah. People forget that. So I have just like pumped out all these women. And now the majority of shows ran in Atlanta and the Atlanta area are uh, Atlanta, Atlanta surrounding area are all shows ran by women that took my class. Wow. That's great. So I accidentally took over by doing that. <laughs> so now I have a cult. Yeah. And I love hey, it because we all need a cult. Listen, and I'm going to be <laughs> honest, there's not enough female cult leaders out there. Uh So I'm proud to take that position. Yeah. And and you're doing it in the right way. Yeah. And and I appreciate that. Let me ask you something about your tact because I'm an older gentleman, you're an adult and a lot of people who start comedy, it seems like they're either 22 or 42. And, and it's a big chunk. It's, it's probably two thirds of the people that start comedy. How do you approach a 22 year old versus a 42 year old as far as coaching them? Okay. So that's a great question because in my classes, uh, level two is the only class that you have to apply for. 
and mm. the only prerequisite is to have finished one of my level one classes. So my level mm. one classes, there is no limit to who takes it, right? Okay. You mm. just, you have to click the button that says I identify as female, blah, blah, blah. Like, and that's mm. about it. Other than that, I've had every single class. I have a range from 21 because I don't, mm. I don't think I've had a 20. I don't think I've had a 20 year old. I might have put in there that I only take 21 and up because the club serves alcohol. So I don't want to be in yeah. that weird position. So mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure everyone I've had is 21. And then I've had all the way up to 80. And every class I have women of every, every single decade, like yeah. 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. almost every single time. Um, it's rare. It's more rare that I have the women in their 70s, but I've had at least five women in their 70s take my class. Wow. And then lots of women in their 60s, tons of women in their 50s and 40s and 30s and 20s. It's not a bad observation. I think what you're seeing is people who actually hit the scene and do it, which are going to generally be people in their 20s who have the free time to do it, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. then usually women in their 40s who've hit their part of their lives where they're like, fuck it, I don't care what anybody thinks of me anymore. Yeah. They're probably either divorced or they just got out of a bad relationship or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And they're like, I'm going to attempt it. Um, so I totally see why those are the most represented women in, you know, starting in comedy and other scenes. But uh, in my class, it's everybody. And I approach it the exact same way. I start in the exact same manner. I go, we've all had life experiences. So when I encourage them to write, when they sign up for the class, I go, start writing. Don't try mm -hmm. to write jokes. Just write your experiences and your observations. That's it. Mm -hmm. Just start there. And then in class, what I essentially, what I promise to everyone is in six weeks, I will teach you what it took me a year to learn in stand up. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a fast forwarded version of a very harsh open mic every week mm -hmm. until we get the finished product. And so I don't really approach it any different way. If people come in and they go, I want to do a whole clean set, mm -hmm. I'm all on board with that. And I guide them that way. That's pretty much the only difference that I make is like when I'm guiding material is if someone says they want to be clean or not. Other than that, a 21-year-old's perspective is just as valid as a 71-year-old's perspective because that's their life experience. The biggest thing that separates is I just encourage no punching down. I encourage punching yeah. up. So I eliminate any punching down, which is funny because a 71-year-old, there's not much punching down they're going to do they've lived 71 years you know like <laughs> yeah. their their experience is totally valid if they want to shit on a 21 year old they're more than welcome to but if the yeah. 21 year old wants to shit on the 71 year old i'm like good luck yeah <laughs> good luck with that good luck getting sympathy from the audience or from your your classmates yeah good luck you know yeah all you get so, is okay boomer that's all you get yeah <laughs> ex you can say okay boomer and that's about it other than that yep. you're kind of on your own you're on your own girl but yeah, I don't, I do not because I feel like it's the same thing. I'm there to help make their observations and experiences concise, tight, and be in the right order, which is mm. the funniest thing is the last thing they say and make sure right. they have a very clear setup Other mm. and, and make sure their act outs and everything else are as, as big as they can be right. if they're necessary in that joke. Other than that, I don't approach it any differently because I'm like, mm -hmm. If you're on stage holding the mic, you're here for a reason. Something mm. got you here. Now, do I do I generally think that the women like 50 and over are funnier? 100%. Because they mm. are. Because they have more shit to talk about. Yeah. And they've experienced more. Yeah. And the, they're well, I think older people are just more comfortable in their skin. And they, yeah. they it, it, nothing, they, I mean, when you've seen as much as you've seen, yes. going up on stage isn't as big of a deal exactly and it's not as big of a deal to them and that and and if you are over 50 and you've signed up for a stand-up comedy class you've been through some shit and i'm ready to hear it and i bet yeah. you it's funnier <laughs> than any and i'm just there to help guide it to make sure it's tight and stage ready uh -huh. and i am not there to change it in any way unless it's the occasional like un uh, unwoke is not the correct term to use but if it's like <laughs> If it's a little, and I'm like, have you been around people in a while? Like, yeah. if you're not allowed to say that anymore, <laughs> you gotta, ugh, we gotta tone that back a little bit. Let's not talk about your taxi driver that one time you were in Amsterdam. Like, that's not a thing. We yeah. can't call him that. You know what I mean? Like, we gotta, uh, like, 
<laughs> so I, every now and then I got to tone down some like, uh, we haven't been in public in a while. Yeah. Uh, kind of stuff. <laughs> But other than that, are, 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 I've got to say my favorites are people who've lived a, lived a life and have something to talk about. So, yeah. yeah. I just bet that that's such an appreciated part of the Atlanta scene. And I hate saying the word safe space, but creating a space where you can be creative mm-hmm. and not worry about somebody hitting on you, somebody thinking your jokes are stupid because they're mm-hmm. geared towards a uh, more woman's point of view and things like mm-hmm. that. I, I I can really appreciate that because I've seen it. And uh, Gwen and yeah. I actually talked about it a little bit. And I had had so many women on the show. I don't feel like I'm sitting in the proper seat to talk about how bad comedy can be for women and how many, how many bad experiences you can have. So I never oh. asked it, but Gwen had talked about it before and i said can i please talk about this and yes i was just about to say you're no you're in the perfect seat to do it what are you talking about you're middle-aged white dude that's the best seat to be in (laughs) that's all we want is someone else to just be a tiny bit women are bombarded with empathy like that's all that's what we have to fight and carry all day every day effing day is just Mm -hmm. trying to think about everyone around whether we want to or not it's just in our freaking blood it's annoying honestly and it would be great to have someone outside of us and our friends sit around and go wait a second what are y'all experiencing what Uh what does it feel like for you why is it shitty for women in comedy like that's all we want is someone Uh just go hey let's listen instead of saying Hey, you know how you could fix it? Maybe you could all come back to open mics again. Maybe don't <laughs> drop out of comedy. Because that's what I used to hear constantly. For the first six years I was in stand-up, every mm-hmm. scene I went to all over the country, I'd go, that's weird. There are no wi- it feels like there's no women here in this scene. And they'd go, yeah, they all quit. And yeah. then I'm like looking around. I'm like, why do they all quit? Why don't you ask us? Yeah. Why don't you yeah, start no with asking the question, what's yeah. wrong why are they not coming back? Is it because they're not funny or because mm-hmm. this is a hostile environment? Like, yeah. what is it? Yeah. It's probably the latter. I'm going to mm-hmm. be honest. It's going to be the latter. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's great yeah. to ask the question. Of course, you're in the, you're in the perfect position to ask the yeah. question. That's all we want is someone else to just be a tiny bit empathetic and just go, what's the deal? What's mm-hmm. the problem? Mm-hmm. So please and, and don't hold back from asking that. After talking to Gwen and now you, I feel more comfortable with it. And you know what? I'm an old married man. I've been with the same woman for 38 years and I have a daughter and I don't think any of that shit's appropriate. And I don't know why men think they can do it. So that's, that's my thing. And I raise my kids not to be like that. And uh, so, yeah, but uh, it, and it bothers me because I know a lot of young women comics that have been through that stuff. And, you know, I just want to be the dad. I just want to be the dad or the grandpa and just beat people up, but I can't do that. (laughs) But um, I wanted to ask you. But you can, but you can. I can. You can. You can be at the shows. (laughs) And if you can see things going down, you can't go, what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. Now you need to apologize to her. Yeah. And you need to say that that's not appropriate here. Don't talk like that to people. And you should do that. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. I'm that yeah. person at shows. I'm yeah. not even a mom yet. Yeah. But I I'm, I'm that person. <laughs> I've been acting like a mom of the scene for years. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's another reason I started the class because like I don't have any kids and I want to pass something down. And I'm like, let me like what can I give back? Like I I want to make more of me. So uh-huh. I don't know, you know, there's nothing wrong. Be the dad. Be yeah. the dad, Scott. Yeah. I, I do it. Well, I, I am. I just don't do I, I have to be careful because I'm a large man and people are already afraid of me. <laughs> that's so. right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. What did you learn about yourself teaching that class? Wow. I learned that I am funnier on the spot than I thought I was. Mm. So when women are just running their material and I go to tag their stuff, things are coming to me left and right because you mm-hmm. know, as an artist, it is when we sit down to write just for ourselves, it is the most painful thing you can possibly do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. You're like, Oh my God, the last thing I want to do is think about myself and my experiences and sit here or listen to your tapes or listen to your recordings and then tag them and talk about uh, th- that's the last thing I want to do. And I'm mm-hmm. like, maybe I don't want to write new stuff because I don't have it in me. Maybe I'm not creative enough. You know, you mm-hmm. beat yourself up for those things. 
And then what I realized is when it's not about me and it's someone else and I'm not attached to it, like there's some TV shows that I've done that I, I got to write on topics and headlines and stuff like that. And that was thousand times easier than mm -hmm. writing, sitting down and writing for myself. Right. If it's not about me, yeah. I, I can't stop. Uh -huh. I'm, I, and I'm giving people tags that are like, that it's not even my style. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm, I'm just, you've now inspired me because you're making me right because I like what you're, go I see where you're going and I want to help you go there. And mm -hmm. my brain works faster when I am, when it's not about me. Yeah. So that I was the, the most, yeah. yeah. And that was the most helpful slash frustrating thing that I learned. Why have I not in this past decade done that for myself? Like that people are paying me for their time and I'm there and I'm teaching them and I feel even more inspired to help when I'm being paid for my time. Mm -hmm. But it's like, why won't I do that for myself when I have mm -hmm. free time? Why am I so frustrated and stressed out? you know, with my own writing when I can write so easily for other people and I'm not writing mm -hmm. their jokes. I'm just tagging and, or suggesting. I'm just like, I see people with an idea when they have rough ideas and I'm just like, Oh, you know what you should do with that. You could go this way. You go that way. And then I inspire them. And then I'm like, why am I not doing that for me? Right. Yeah. That's yeah. been, that's, it's been a beautiful slash, like I said, frustrating thing. Uh huh. It is painful. It, it's yeah. it's so painful to look at your last. It's painful to look at your last bit, and it's painful mm -hmm. to look at your last year. And it's it's hard. And, and it's always but, hard. Yeah, yeah. And to know that I could do it for other people when it's not about me, I'm like, what's well? Oh yeah. shit! What am I? <laughs> what am I ignoring with me? Oh yeah. no! <laughs> this is something I gotta work out. Oh, I don't. <laughs> Oh man. Yeah. That's frustrating. That's frustrating. So I wanted to ask you in recent years, you've had a lot of good experience acting that seems to be rolling for you a little bit. What happens if you become like a big star and all of a sudden you're getting put in movies and stuff like that. And it takes away from your comedy career. If you had the opportunity, would you walk away from comedy or would you still make time? No. For it? No, no. The goal is always to, for one to feed the other, like that's mm. it. And that's what I've experienced so far. And I'm glad that from the outside, it seems that things are going really well because it's, it's because, so I, I started acting when I was nine. Uh -huh. Obviously things didn't like take off. I ended up having to like do pageants for a long time. And then I had to go to college and then I did this and I did that. And I bartended for 12 years and I did so much in between and then nothing was happening. And once I did comedy and then got good at comedy, then acting started taking off. And then mm -hmm. once I started getting better acting gigs, then I would get better comedy gigs and then uh. it's vice versa. <laughs> so it's uh -huh. like the comedy world takes you more seriously, the more credits you get. Well, the acting world takes you more seriously, the better you are at auditions. And I was better at auditions because I was so much, I was getting better on stage because the more mm -hmm. comfortable you are with yourself, right. That we learn in stand up, the more comfortable I am on camera. So mm -hmm. it's all just feeds itself. But here's, what's funny is the acting gigs that I get are um, directly related to me as a comedian. Like they're all, all the best stuff that I've gotten have been reporter and host roles, yeah. which is just me. Uh -huh. I'm not a character <laughs> when I'm doing that. I'm just me. So yeah. I audition five times a week, if not more through my agency. So mm -hmm. I'm auditioning constantly, but everything I get booked on are all host and reporter roles, which is just me talking into a uh -huh. mic. Right. And the, what do I do best, <laughs> but talk into a mic. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of like they, feed they didn't even each have other. to tell you how to hold it. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I'm like, dude, I got 90% of this. You just tell me the words. I got yeah. the rest. I'm so good at this. <laughs> so it's funny. Like I used to be like, oh, I'm going to be this actor one day. And then uh -huh. the more I got into it, I was like, I think I'm just good at being me. I don't know yeah. how great I am at being a character as much as I am just comfortable in my own skin. And mm -hmm. now finally, for the first time. And, uh, and that's what fuels the other. So yeah, of course I would love like a bridesmaids type trajectory where I get some fun, yeah. silly role. Cause my dream would be to be like the Melissa McCarthy character, you know, uh -huh. in a film, like I want to be the goofy odd person and be that part of me that I always feel like I am. 
mm-hmm. and play that role and then that get me other roles like that yeah that's that's the dream and then i would never stop doing stand up like joan rivers is my idol like that's mm-hmm. i want to work and i want to have dates on the calendar until i die like i want to have dates i can't make it to because i'm 85 and i die (laughs) you know like like, that's that's what my goal is so i think it all should feed each other and Uh i think stand up is the one thing that's always me so i would always want to fall back on just telling my truth and just being me um but yeah i'm gonna be in ozark oh i really yeah i'm a uh i i've filmed it earlier this year but it was a reporter role uh-huh. but it's the biggest thing that i have coming up so i had like five lines if they keep them all who knows they cut yeah. i've been cut out of, i was cut out of a steve carell movie that i was in but uh-huh. i still get residuals for it so yeah but i played a reporter <laughs> in it uh but i still get residuals for it so wow it still works yeah. for me but uh um, yeah. i got to work with john stewart and steve carell and all those guys mm-hmm. and it was amazing but i don't have any footage of it and then uh yeah i'm actually i'm and i don't i've done all the math and i don't think they can cut me out of the scene that i'm in yeah okay (laughs) playing a reporter in ozark so i'm in episode uh seven of season four of ozark all right well i'm an ozark fan so i'll definitely so am i it's the biggest (laughs) thing that i like outside of that steve carell movie that i did this was this was the first time i had been booked in something that i watched Mm-hmm. So yeah. it was huge. I yeah. enjoyed the hell out of it. And um, let's hope they don't cut me out. So season four, uh, episode Excellent. seven, I should be in Ozark. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've got a quick question that I ask just about everybody. Uh, what do you know now, being a stand-up comic, that you wish you would have known when you started? I covered a little of it, which was to to make sure that you're just talking from your own perspective and you're not trying to be somebody else. I think Mm. all of us should be wary of whether we're emulating someone or we're just trying to be somebody that we think the audience likes. Mm. But like I said, that comes with time. There's nothing you can force about that. I think the other thing I wish that I would have known then when I first started that I know now is just throw it all against the wall. Like, throw everything out there, do Mm -hmm. all of it, start a YouTube channel and whatever would have been out when I first started comedy, like Mm -hmm. Vine and all that stuff. I wish, I wish I would have not held back. I wish I would Uh have had a blog and a podcast and a this and a that and all that. And that I would have consistently done multiple things from the beginning to see what stuck instead Mm -hmm. of waiting until I was inspired to do a thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I waited so long to think like, but I think that's just my mentality. Maybe my generation where I were like, we wait until we're really good at something or really Mm -hmm. inspired at something before we do something instead of like this Gen Z where they just do it, whether they're good at it or not. I I wish I would have had that mentality of just doing something because eventually you're going to be good at it. Yeah. If you do it enough, you know what I mean? And that makes and sense if, because the bad stuff yeah. that you do, people forget anyway. So it's they forget not, it all. Yeah, it doesn't like matter. Like if you yeah. suck at it, who gives a shit? Once yeah. you get better at it, that's what they'll remember. And the hard, yeah. hardcore true fans will be like, we've been with you from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I'm sad that I don't have is like outside of my stand up fans. Like I don't have that in any other genre i waited for so long to start a podcast i waited for so long to do everything i wish i would have listened to i'm gonna he's gonna hate this but my husband he was right he told me (laughs) he's always right Uh, he's like you should be doing this why aren't you doing that why aren't you doing this why don't you you have a youtube channel about blah 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 and i'm like i don't know yet what i want my youtube channel to be called (laughs) so i can't start it (laughs) <laughs> and if I would have had a nine year YouTube channel, I'd have four shows on Netflix right now. Like what yep. the hell? Why did I wait so long for everything? It's weird because it's a lot of work for one thing. And, and second, you get so many false starts cause I've tried some things and sure. I, you, you, you get so many false starts and then you start doubting yourself and then you just walk away from it. And yep. that's kind of where I'm at everything except for this. So yeah, yeah, it's, it doesn't matter to me. I'm not trying to be famous or anything, but I was enjoying myself, the stuff that I did. So just 
do it because you enjoy it. Do it because you enjoy it, it, whether it's perfect or not. That is Mm. the number one thing that I would pass on to anyone is just do it because you enjoy it. Right. As long as you're not hurting anybody, do it and do it consistently. You'll Mm -hmm. get better at it. Why wait? Yeah. Yeah. You know, no doubt. That's good advice. So, Lace, where can people find you if they want to see where you're going to be and what you're working on? Uh, that's a great question. I need to update my website. I've been so bad since the pandemic happened. I just kind of uh, deleted the whole part of my website that says where I'm going to be. So now I just kind of post everything on Instagram. And I feel like that's where most people go anyway. But please, uh-huh. uh, Instagram, at Lace Larrabee. Twitter, at Lace Larrabee. My podcast, the biggest thing people could do to to help me out or support me would be to follow Cheaties, and that's Cheaties like Wheaties, but with a C. My podcast co-host and I are both comedians. We both got cheated on and caught the guys in the same way. And right. so we commiserated over that, and we started uh-huh. a podcast, and we just released episode 152 today. And we started it over the pandemic. Uh, We work really hard at it. We make no money at it. Uh, Uh It is on iTunes. It's on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, all those places. And um, some subscribers and reviews, uh, merch purchases are the best thing that could help us out. So people could just follow Chidi's podcast. That would be incredible. Yeah, Excellent. And I have to ask, do you have a Frenchie over your shoulder there? She is a, um, <laughs> look at her. You, I don't know if you can see her eyes. Her eyes look ridiculous right now. Uh-huh. She is a, uh, a little schnauzer mix. Oh, is it? She's okay. Like it looks, looks kind of Frenchy uh, from here. Yeah. No. Cammy, come here. She's half deaf. She's 13 and a half, so she can't hear oh, okay. anything. So this oh, is my little beast. Hi, sweetie. There's my little beast. Yeah. So her name's Cammy. She needs a haircut. I give her haircuts now because... She started having seizures a year ago. Oh, uh, yeah. So she's on seizure meds, and she does great with them. Uh, she's doing much better now than she was a little over a year ago. And uh, so, yeah, I, I like to give her her own haircuts and stuff now. So she's not <laughs> as pretty as she could be. She's a good girl. She's yeah, a good girl. Yeah. She's a good girl. Ah. Well, Lace, thank you so much for being on the show. I really admire what you're doing there in the Atlanta scene for the other comedians, making that space where they can be creative without feeling threatened. And that's fantastic. And I'm Thanks, glad Scott. you're doing that. And you're funny. I, I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, oh, as, a, as a comedian, I always tell people that I'm always like analyzing when I watch comedians. I'm always getting too much in my head trying to extract knowledge. Yeah. But yeah. yours, I was actually able to relax and just enjoy the show. So Oh, that, my yeah. heart. Oh, that yeah, makes me feel great. so good. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. I hope that's <laughs> I hope that's my experience. That, that, I hope that's why. I, yeah. I like that. Also, I just want to say, I know you complimented me about like, you know, helping other comics and putting it out there. So I have two, two things I want to say. I have had everything from uh, one of the people, the very first class that I ever taught, she is now a writer for Jimmy Kimmel. Wow. Yeah, not because of me, granted. I just helped her with stand-up. She was already a writer and all these things beforehand. Mm-hmm. And uh, she really, like, attacked Twitter really hard, like, over uh-huh. uh, over the pandemic. And she got really famous on Twitter, went viral like crazy, got, like, 300,000 extra followers. Like, I mean, went it went nuts. And then... Jimmy Kimmel hired her and now she's a writer. Now she lives in LA. She's doing that. Right. So I have everything from that to as of yesterday, I was on Twitter last night and I'm scrolling and I see a video of the latest psycho on a plane. Who's acting (laughs) crazy, who gets taken off the plane by the air marshal. And Uh it was another student of mine. (laughs) (laughs) So, when you thank me for putting out comedy and helping out people, yeah, sure, I do good things like, you know, help people who end up being super successful on wow. Jimmy Kimmel. And then also, up until yesterday, the latest video of a lady who she she brought her own sound system, which I got to give her. I did tell people to be prepared. Yeah. So she brought her own sound system with a mic on her face and a speaker on her hip, and she set it all up. And it was 20 minutes before the plane landed. There's videos all over the internet now of it. And uh, and she starts screaming about the pandemic started because of something, something on the internet. I don't know what she's saying, oh, no. but she's like getting attacked by both sides by like the flood. And I recognized her immediately. I was like, 
I know her. That's somebody who took my class. Holy shit. And then I looked through my phone and she texted me like in November last year and was like, Hey, I'm really, I'm going crazy. I'm dying to get back on stage. Uh I want to come back up to Atlanta because she lives part-time in Puerto Rico and then part-time in Atlanta. And she's like, Mm -hmm. I'm dying to get back on stage. I'd love to take your class again. And where can I get on stage? I was like, girl, there's probably not going to be anything to like 2022. So uh-huh. I don't know if I can help you. And uh, yeah, she figured out a way to get, take herself to stardom. So I've got two famous people who well, yeah. came from my class. So they run the that's, gamut. Yeah. Listen, so I approach everyone the story. same way. Yeah, I approach yeah. everyone the same way. The way they take it is, the, the you know, I, I have nothing to do with that. So... <laughs> Thanks again for being on the show. I, I really appreciate it. I learned stuff, and I think everybody cool. that listens are going to learn stuff. Okay. All right. Well, Thanks, thank Scott. you.